Okay, everyone, it's 10 after. Um, let's get started. So last Thursday, what we talked about was all the different DNA sequencing technologies and all the innovations over the last, well, 50 years, really, um, that have gotten us to where we are today, where we can use high throughput DNA sequencing technologies, either short read sequencing like Illumina or long read sequencing like Nanopore or PacBio, uh, essentially as a way to understand um, cell biology is essentially exploiting these technologies as readouts for different things that are going on in the cell like RNA expression or genetic variation or what parts of chromatin are accessible or inaccessible. And thankfully for us now there are standards in terms of the, the types of data that these DNA sequencing technologies emit and all of them as we learned last time emit data files in, in FASTQ format. And just to ring, uh, remind yourselves, um, FASTQ format is, a, is a, yet another big text file. It's, it's flawed, um, but it's what we got. Um, each, each DNA sequence that comes off of a, whatever device you're using represents four lines in a FASTQ file. Remember, there's the, the name of the sequence, some sort of identifier, what pore it came from, or where it was on these uh, flow cells. Um, the DNA sequence itself, which remember might have errors in it. Um, this, this sort of confusing plus sign, which is a separator, that's the third line. And then the fourth line is these characters that represent the, the quality scores, the so-called FRED quality scores for each of the nucleotides. And those quality scores, the higher they are, the more confident that the called base, say A, is actually an A. Um, the lower the, the number, uh, even though it's characters, they encode numbers, um, the lower the number, the, the less confident the technology was. What we're going to talk about today is what we do with those FASTQ files. Basically, I don't really know, uh, well, there are a couple sort of more uh, obscure approaches, but most, most technologies or most assays require that we take FASTQ files and align them to a reference genome or search for patterns within those files. So today what we're going to talk about is how we map and align sequences to a reference genome. And I'm going to talk about the distinction between mapping and alignment. It's a pretty fundamental difference. Um, so in principle, it's a, it's a super easy concept. I mean, you know, we, we've got a bunch of data and what we'd like to be able to do is align to the reference genome and that's the raw signal that um, gives us, you know, our nice figure three in our, our paper, right? That's, that's the readout that we're using to infer whether or not our hypothesis was right. Did, was there a change in gene expression when we put mice on a different diet or when we knocked out this gene? Did something change? Essentially, answering that question depends upon sequence alignment, right? You're, if you're aligning RNAs, you have to, uh, if, if you're trying to figure out differential expression in two conditions, effect you have to start with sequence alignment. And I think as a community, uh, as a genomics community, we take a lot sequence mapping and alignment a bit too much for granted that we just use um, technologies that you know previous papers have published without really thinking about what's going on and what decisions these aligners are making and how that might actually impact the biology that we're trying to study. So what I'm going to try and walk through today is how these approaches work and give you some sense of what they typically do right and what they might do wrong. Okay, so some of the inherent problems to this is that, first of all, the human genome is big. Um, it's 3.1 billion, billion base pairs haploid. And to make it worse, um, it's really, really complex in the sense that there's repeats all over the genome. So. If, if, the, if the human genome sequence were completely random, that is, we had a four-sided die and we rolled it 3.1 billion times and each time we, rolled, we wrote down what letter came up, sequence alignment would be really easy because essentially there would be very few repeats on the order of the 150 base pair reads that we get out of, the, out of a Illumina sequencer. But because the, that's not the way the, the human genome is, is you know, evolution created uh, the human genome, there are repeats all over, and those repeats are much bigger than the typical read size that we get, and that poses problems. 
Um, so that's challenge one. Sequence aligners and mappers have to figure out where in the genome these short fragments go. It has to do that um, for billions of sequences. So we don't want to wait you know, weeks to, to get a counting RNA-seq counting experiment done, right? Well, the, the aligners that came out when I was in grad school, um, well, the aligners that existed when I was in grad school could not scale to this, to this level of throughput. They, they just didn't work. So in sort of 2004 through 2007, well, really 2010, there were a lot of papers published on just new, clever approaches to do the alignment of billions of sequences to a complex reference genome like the human or the mouse genome in a matter of hours rather than weeks. Um, so thankfully, we don't have to deal with that anymore. You can basically align and do differential expression analysis on an RNA-seq experiment in an afternoon. Um, the other problem is that these technologies, sequencing technologies, make mistakes. And when there's errors in the sequence, that makes figuring out where these sequences go in a big, repetitive human genome quite, quite difficult, even more difficult than if those sequences had no mistakes at all. And I think the thing I really want to emphasize is accurate, like doing the best alignment possible of your sequences, given the biological question that you're going after. It may take time to do it exhaustively or properly, but it's worth it. Because if you take shortcuts in alignment and mapping, um, you pay the price in terms of um, either amplifying a false signal that you think is biological or attenuating a true biological signal that, um, that may exist but you actually miss because of biases in the alignment. And so shortcuts lead to the, such artifacts. Um, and I think the trick here is that depending upon the type of experimentation that you're doing, whether you're doing RNA-seq alignment, if you're looking for differential expression, you may choose to do your alignment in one strata with one alignment algorithm or with a, a particular reference genome. Maybe it's the, the DNA sequence or maybe it's um, the transcriptome, so the sequence of all the isoforms that are expressed in a given organism. Um, if you're looking for allele-specific expression, you might choose to do things slightly differently. If you're looking for somatic mutations in a, in a tumor genome, you might, you actually probably would choose to do your alignment uh, slightly differently. Okay, uh, so really this is kind of the standard workflow. We get our data off a machine in FASTQ format. We go through some black box process which is aligning to a genome. We typically like to do some sort of quality control just to make sure that uh, the alignments seem right. Um, did we actually, is the DNA that came off this machine actually from the organism that we thought it was? If we align to the supposed organism's reference genome and we have a low number of sequences that align, that might tell us that something went wrong. That's sort of the, a fundamental piece of QC. Is my data from the critter that I think it is? Um, other types of quality control would be how many differences are there in a typical sequence versus the reference genome. So in a human genome, we know that any two human uh, genomes differ on average like one out of every 700 base pairs. So if, in our, if we say sequence my genome, align it to the human reference genome, and lo and behold, we find there's a difference every 10 base pairs, that tells us potentially a couple of things. Either my data that came off this machine are really, really terrible quality, or maybe there's something wrong. Maybe there's some contamination in the sequence. Like, why would I get that many differences? Or, or like, you know, somebody wiped their fingers on this digital camera that's in this sequencer and it's just like had a terrible time trying to track all these DNA sequences. So, um, a fundamental um, truism in genomics, really in any science, is always distrust your data. Assume that it's wrong. Prove to yourself that there aren't artifacts before you move on with any conclusions. Look at the data, plot it, open it up in a tool called IGV, look at the, you know, count how many differences there are on average before you do any, make any figures or report on it in, in uh, RIP in your lab. Um, 
there are probably problems with your data. I, I, I rarely come across a data set that the first time didn't have some slightly nuanced problem with it that has to be accounted for when trying to um, figure out what the real biological signal is in the data. Okay, so that, that alignment and that quality control is, this is the sort of the core, step. these are the core steps that underlie all these different types of analyses that we could do, like quantifying transcripts or finding ataxic peaks or, or finding structural variants. Yeah? So are there specific reference genomes for like different kinds of mice or is there just like one mouse reference genome? Um, until very recently, there's really just been one uh, mouse reference genome that has gone through multiple versions and that um, but I don't know I don't know where you access them at the moment but I know there's been efforts at the Sanger Institute to, to develop reference genomes for each of the different commonly used lab strains I'm not a mouse geneticist so I don't really know what the state of the art there is but I think there are other options besides black six anyone else know anyone do that type of work can chime in All right, so FASTQ file alignment. What do we need to do? So the first step here is what I would call mapping. That is, for each of the, let's say we have a FASTQ file with 4 billion lines in it. That means there's four, uh, 1 billion sequences that came off of our Illumina run. We need to find a possible home or all the possible homes locations in the genome for each of those 1 billion sequences, okay? Some of those sequences, because of the repetitive nature of the human genome, may have thousands of possible locations to which they could align. Then, for each read and each possible location to which that read could align, we have to do a precise nucleotide by nucleotide alignment. So that's like registering the sequence that's in the read to the reference genome, nucleotide by nucleotide. And were there no mistakes, that would be a somewhat trivial problem. But even in the absence of mistakes, there are genetic differences between the individual that we sequence and the reference genome. So alignment is actually figuring out the optimal registration of each of the nucleotides in the read versus the reference genome in the face of sequencing error and in the face of um, polymorphism, okay? If that isn't done right, you can have major problems. Um, for instance, if the error rate of the technology is fairly high, like with nanopore sequencing, and you're looking for single nucleotide differences, if the alignment algorithm that you use, sort of the scoring scheme, which we'll talk about later, isn't Sort of calibrated to the error profile of the technology, you can get lots of false positive predictions of genetic differences between the sequences and the reference genome that are merely the consequence of the improper use of a, of a scoring scheme given the error profile of the technology. Okay? So like anything else, and I think this is an underappreciated part of sort of computational biology, is you got to use the right technique the right tool for the right for the question that you're asking. I think that's much more appreciated in molecular biology, but it's true also when doing sort of basic data processing and computational biology. You got to choose the right statistic for the question you're asking. You got to choose the right aligner for the data that you have, and you got to um, set up your experiment and the analysis and the quality control in a way that's that's germane to the biology that you're trying to study. Uh, yeah. So I talked about this, we've said this multiple times, but um, you know, half of the human genome is comprised of repeats. Um, and, and really what that leads to is situations like this. We talked about this a couple lectures ago, where um, if, if, part, if the genome, this is a snippet of a FASTA file from, the, from human chromosome one, if the sequence is repetitive, it's usually in lowercase uh, nucleotides, and if it's not repetitive with respect to a tool called repeat masker which sort of scans the human genome and looks for sequences that smell like repeats it'll be capital letters but you know 45 to 50 percent of the human genome is these lowercase characters and it's these regions of the genome that pose a lot of problems 
for uh, sequence eliminators. Like this, this part I highlighted up here, there's this repeat of TAA CCC that's, I've alternated it when red and black for each of the copies of the repeat and you can see it goes on and on. And maybe, maybe the sequence that comes off the machine is the, the length of this line it's going to have a tough time placing it here in the reference genome, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here, or here, right? Okay, and that's uh, analogous to this, this jigsaw puzzle problem that I've talked about. Um, here's a, a jigsaw puzzle, the cover of it, where we've got this water and the sky, and the sky is insidiously reflected in the water, making it really difficult to figure out if we took a little snippet if the DNA sequencing read was this little snippet here, we wouldn't know if the sequence belonged here or here or here or here or here or here, right? It's the little pixel differences, which are the analog to single nucleotide changes, that give us the little tidbits of information that help us decide it belongs here versus here. Yeah. So essentially, take advantage of the fact that a read is longer and take bigger chunks of information from that read to figure out where it goes in the reference genome? Yeah. Yes, yes, that's exactly what you can do. Now, not all, not all sequence aligners exploit that opportunity, but in principle, that's what you would want to do. But the other side of the coin is that those technologies have higher error rates. So those bigger snippets that you're taking have more errors within them. So that's this, this tug of war between the bite, um, the bite uh, that you take out of the read and the mismatches that are in it um, in terms of how much information that gives you to properly place the sequence in the genome. Yeah? So do you get a billion reads out of like, PacLite or PacLite or whatever the sequence is? I don't know what the total number of reads actually is from PacLite. It's definitely not a billion. It's probably on the order of a few hundred million. Um, if anyone has worked, I've actually never worked with a PacLite data set, but when I say billions, that's typically referring to Illumina. So you get many small pieces. Um, whereas with you know PacBio, it might be fewer, but pieces that are, that are this big, right? OK, so this is the problem. We've got this, you know, you go to Barnes & Noble and you look at the, like, the crazy puzzle section. And there's some of them in there that are just insane. And that's kind of what this is like. And we don't, we don't want to suffer through having to put this piece, this puzzle together, um, you know, over three weeks, like it used to take me. Um, we want to do this in seconds. And that's where innovations from thankfully really clever uh, scientists who came into computational biology, people like Ben Langmead and um, Waterman and Smith and Needleman and Wunsch and Hung Lee and, and uh, Gene Myers and all these people have contributed immensely. I think they're underappreciated uh, for really clever algorithmics to do this stuff fast and accurately. Because, you know, what if, if we were sequencing thousands of genomes to study genetic variation of some trait, and it took, like, the heat death of the universe to, to align all those sequences? It's, it's, you know, we can't really exploit the technology. So these computational advances have really allowed us to leverage the molecular advances that have come about over the last 20 years. Okay, right. So let's imagine we have some DNA that we put into this. I think this would be an Illumina sequencer, yep. Um, and it gives us out perfect sequences, no errors. What we put in is exactly what we get out. This would be great. Um, because computers are really good at finding exact matches. So this is kind of like Google. I mean, when you search uh, in Google and you type it in the right way, it, it gets high confidence, relevant results really, really quickly. If you're like me and type poorly, a lot of times it's like, did you mean this actually? Or, and sometimes those results are so far away because I've made too many mistakes and I can't even guess what, I'm, what I typed. So in the case of exact matches, um, you know, there, there are many so-called string matching algorithms. Um, we've learned one. Well, we've learned a tool uh, on, in Unix that's really good at this. What's it called? 
I think I heard grep. Yeah, grep. Grep is really great at finding exact matches. But the reality is that sequencing errors make happen, and they happen frequently. So we can have differences um, between what was put in a T T C, but maybe this C got confused was confused as a T because of maybe fluorescence bleed through between adjacent uh, clusters on this Illumina device, and therefore, because sequence aligners know that there's potential for differences between the reference genome and the sequence that we're aligning, owing to both sequencing error and genetic polymorphism, it has to do so-called fuzzy matching. It has to look for not only exact matches, but matches that are within what's called a certain edit distance, a number of changes. So um, car and cat have an edit distance of one. If you just change the R to a T or a T to an R, you get a match. That's, that's what these sequence aligners have to, um, have to take uh, care of. And doing so makes it a much more computationally challenging or expensive or time-consuming process. So I think intuitively, the higher the error rate and or the higher the polymorphism rate in the species that you're studying, the more complicated and challenging proper alignment is to a reference genome. And therefore, um, it's more prone to sort of systematic biases. So the question about um, mouse reference genomes is fairly apt because some of the um, strains that we end up studying, like uh, Castaneous, for instance, is very, very different. The polymorphism rate differences between Castaneous and Black 6 are enormous. So when you align, I think it's something like one out of every 200 base pairs or something. So if you align sequences for Castaneous to the Black 6 genome, it's a little tricky. You've got sequencing error and you've got a lot of polymorphism driving you know, the locations that a, an aligner chooses um, to put those reads to the reference genome. Any questions about that? Yeah. So if you're amplifying the DNA, and then so you have one read where you have maybe 10 different reads that are all layered, uh, so essentially, is that error going to repeat itself? So, sorry, can you, can you say that again? I don't quite follow what you mean. So when you amplify, you have one read that may align, but since you're amplified it, it duplicates, right? And you're talking about the amplification on the flow cell uh, this, during sequencing? Yeah, during sequencing, yeah. So you won't just have one snippet that might be for one location because they could have been duplicated, right? Ah, so that was probably my fault in explaining it. That amplification, all those, let's say um, the original single-stranded molecule gets amplified into a thousand clones. That, that cluster still generates just one sequence. But that one sequence may be um, a part of the reference genome that is repetitive and could have lots of different options, but it's not amplified by a thousand given the number of copies. It's, so the amplification is just to boost the fluorescence signal so that the camera can figure out what the nucleotide sequence is, but it all gets distilled down to one sequence that's assigned to that clonally amplified cluster. Okay? Right, so, so mapping versus alignment, I've already kind of touched upon this, but mapping is, let's find, let's use the fastest possible algorithms to find all the possible locations or loci to which a sequence could be aligned. Once we have that set of places, it might, for some sequences, it might be one possible place in the reference genome it's, if it's totally unique sequence. And for some, it might be millions. Um, the original version of Illumina was Selexa, and I think the first data set we got from Selexa was a 24 nucleotide run. So we got like, you know, a few hundred million sequences, but each of those sequences were 24 base pairs. There's lots of repeats in the human genome that are bigger than 24 base pairs. So there were some sequences that we got that had like 5 million possible locations in the reference genome. So it's sort of like you just flip a 5 million sided coin and choose one, essentially. OK. Um, right. So we find all those possible locations. And then what we'll dig into in a little more later is, is um, to, to figure this, this optimal 
base by base alignment of that sequence to that particular locus in the reference genome. And that is critical, I think, intuitively, because that is the substrate that's used to figure out where there are true genetic differences in the DNA that we sequenced versus the reference genome. And we'll start talking about that maybe next week. Okay. All right, so I'm going to talk about how one algorithm for mapping, the mapping step works. So remember, mapping is finding all the possible locations in the reference genome. And I think it's pretty clever. Um, this is called either, it's often called either hash-based or Kamer-based mapping. Um, it's essentially creating an index of the genome. And I'll talk about what that means. But before we get into that, let's just think about what is an index in a book used for? What, actually, what, what are the contents of an index in, say, a, um, in a textbook? What does it tell you? Right, so what's the, what's the key? What are the keys in the index? Words, or words, right? Um, you know, the author has chosen which words to put in the index, but in principle, those are typically those are well chosen. And then, as you said, I think, um, for each word that's in the index, there's a list of page numbers at which that word occurs. So indexing a genome is doing the same thing. We choose a word length, and in this case, a word is a sequence of nucleotides of length k. k is sort of just a mathematically chosen variable to represent the length of the word. Um, so k, a, a, a seven-mer, or where k equals seven, is a sequence of seven nucleotides that are chosen from the reference genome. So we can hash or index a genome by choosing a value of k. We're going to start with a very simple value of k in a, in a minute for this toy example. And then literally what we do is we start at the beginning of the FASTA file, and we go all the way to the end, and we step nucleotide by nucleotide, and we ask, all right, what is the, let's say we're working with a sevenmer. What are the seven nucleotides at this position in the genome? Okay, what position am I at in the genome? Put an entry in the index. The sevenmer exists at this position. Slide over one base pair. Ask what came sevenmer is there. We keep track of the position, and we build up this crazy index. And what I'll show you is how that index can actually expedite finding possible locations for sequences in the reference genome. But I mean, if I, if I lose you or if I explain this poorly, think of the index as literally just an index in a textbook. It's the, the list of the locations of all occurrences of all words in a, in a genome, where words are, are these nucleotide sequence of a predetermined length. So in our case, this is the reference genome. It's, it's a sad little reference genome. Um, but what we've decided to do is we've set k equal to 3. So I'm going to start at the beginning, and I'm going to build up an index. I'm going to show you the index for this genome with k equal 3, so word length equal 3. So cat, C-A-T, uh, exists at starting position 1. We slide over one nucleotide. A-T-G exists at position 2. T-G-G exists at position 3. I'm going to belabor this a little bit. GGT at position 4. GTC 5, TCA 6, ah, we've hit CAT again. We don't add a new entry in the index, right? Because we've already seen CAT. So now we just say, all right, well, CAT exists at 1 and 7, position 7. Okay, And we don't need to store the end of it because we, we know the length of K. So we know that it goes from 7 to 10 because K equals 3, or 7 to 9 inclusive, I guess. And we do this by ripping through the entire genome. This is fast because we have this pathetic little genome, but for a 3 billion base pair genome, you can imagine that would, that would take a program maybe like 30 seconds or something to, to build that up. All right. Um, so we've done this just on the forward strand. Remember that the reference genome is just on, is, has one, it represents an artificially chosen, sort of, we think of it as 5 prime to 3 prime, but remember there's an entirely other strand to this. I've just tracked the k that, that occur um, on one strand. 
But if you're doing this for real, you, you track the camera occurrences on the other strand too. All right, so this is not, we haven't mapped anything. This is just looking at a reference genome and, and trying to index it so that we can exploit this index to, to do the mapping step for these billions of sequences really, really quickly. So, um, all right, so how do we do that? This is where I think it gets pretty cool. And if you're, I just want to say, if you're, um, if you're really, if you're into this at all and think it's um, at all interesting and want to learn more, there's a great paper uh, from Jim Mulliken's lab called Saha. Um, I can, if you are interested, email me. I'll send you the paper. But it explains how this this works um, in great detail and really, really intuitively. And then it gives some nice sort of examples of how we can leverage some kind of geometry to make this um, mapping step even better. It's, it's uh, one of the better written papers in this area. All right, so we've taken our toy genome. We've built a KMER or a hash index of that genome. Now we've got a sequence. This is one of, say, one billion sequences that came off this machine. I call them either reads or sequences interchangeably. Uh, and it's, it's equally sad. It's just a little six base pair sequence. But I think it will illustrate how we leverage this index to figure out an opt the list of locations to which this sequence could align very quickly. So we've, we have to know what the KMER size that was chosen to index the genome is. So we would tell the aligner, hey, I've got, you've got an index available to you that has k equal 3. So knowing that, we can then break up the read into KMERs. So what we can do is say, all right, the first KMER in my read is TGG. I'm going to look that thing up in the index, and it's got two matches, a position 3, boom, and position 10, boom. So those are two possible locations that that read could go. But there's more information in this read, right? There's another KMER. Well, there's multiple other KMERs. So now we can slide over. I'm going to skip three nucleotides and just look at the next at this last KMER, TCA, and see that it has one possible location at K, uh, K, uh, position 6. Okay. So TGG align is at position 3 and position 10, but this TCA has a possible location at match at um, position 6. I skip three nucleotides, so the fact that we have this one at position three and this one at position six, those two locations of the reference genome are three nucleotides apart. So that's the that's the trick. You can say, oh, I've got two exact matches that are three nucleotides apart, and guess what? I skip three nucleotides when I look for those matches. This is a really good candidate because it's a, an exact match. So this is a place that the, we don't have to do any alignment here. Because we know just by looking up in this index that we have an exact nucleotide by nucleotide match in a reference genome. So this is at least one possible location. Does that make sense? Now we could align to position 10 as well, but we'd have to suffer from, we'd get this TGG max match, we get a T match, but the T and the C afterwards would be mismatches with the C and the A and the read. So that would be a less confident alignment location in the reference genome than this perfectly exact match that we could figure out without having to do any alignment at all. We're just looking up these uh, index hits. Um, so if you've never written or done anything like this, this is like best case scenario. We don't have to do any alignment and as I'll show you, the alignment step is really laborious. So if we can get an exact match in the reference genome with the, with the index, it's great. We, don't, we can skip that step completely. All right, so that was a bit easy because the read and the reference genome exactly matched. But as I said, there's polymorphism, there's sequencing error. So let's let's walk through an example where we where we don't get this exact match. All right, so now our read differs slightly. We've got this error. Um, we've got TGG TCT, and I'm I'm highlighting this nucleotide because just we know that it's an error. But in principle, you don't know, right? You don't know what are real sequence differences and what's an error. Okay, so same thing. We find that uh, the 3 and the 10 match for the first KMER. And then we look up TCT. Huh. It's not in there. It's not in the reference genome. 
So what do we do? We really, the two locations are really just this 3 and the 10. We would have to do an exact nucleotide by nucleotide alignment of TGG, TCT to this, starting at this location. So TGG, TCA versus TGG, TCT differs by one nucleotide, right? Um, so so that's, that's the challenge. We don't always get those exact matches, so we can use that index, sorry, we can use this index to build up a list of candidate loci, but then we have to do that, most of the time we have to do this exhaustive nucleotide and nucleotide step, um, alignment step to figure out if it goes to this location in the genome, how many differences are there, okay? All right, so one of the challenges is like, what's, what's the optimal size of this K, this choice of K, the word size that we use to build up an index? Um, in, in this toy example, it was like a 15 or 16 nucleotide genome. It's, it's contrived, and so I use K equal three, and that works great. But, you know, how do you figure out the optimal hash size for the human genome? Well, let's think about the worst case scenario. What if K is equal to one? I already kind of hinted at this. Why is it the worst case scenario of K equal one? How much information is there of K equal one? What, what would that index look like? Say, I think you, I couldn't hear you, but I said, Right, so I mean, the, the, if you had k equal 1, that's so only going to be four entries in your index. An entry for a, an entry for c, an entry for p, and an entry for g. And each of those are going to have roughly 3.1 billion divided by four possible matches, right? Well, we know gc content is, what, like 45%. So a and t are going to have 27.5% of the hits, and g and c will have whatever the math is. Um, so k equal one is a very poor choice. It doesn't really get us anything, okay? But um, there's a question in the back about long read sequences and how we can take these bigger chunks and get more information. So that's, that's the other side of the coin. We could make k something really big. Like, what if we made k equal 500? So uh, roughly, just back of the envelope calculation, there would be 3.1 billion divided by 500 entries in the index. And yeah, there are probably many of those entries would only have like one location in the genome. So the trade-off here is that the larger K, that the larger K is, the more memory, computer memory, that's required to store an index that big. Um, so there's this balance between choosing a large enough K such that you have roughly unique information such that when you get a match of length k in your read, you have a pretty good sense that, yeah, that's a good location in the reference genome to put it, versus like, you know, you'd like to be able to do alignment on a MacBook Pro from, you know, six years ago with, with two gigabytes of RAM instead of having the, have a terabyte of RAM. Okay, so um, just thinking through this a bit more, uh, if k equals three, there's four to the third possibilities. So there's AAA, there's AAC, AAG, um, all the way to TTT. So that's four to the third is 64, right? So if k equals three, your index has 64 entries, but that's still, I think, kind of intuitive that that's probably not a large enough k because most sequences that you're gonna get are gonna have you know, probably one of many of each of these camers in it especially if it's like 150 nucleotide sequence, there's gonna be 50, um, uh, roughly 50 threemers in that, um, and, and there are probably gonna be lots of hits with a, a K of, of this length. So maybe let's jump ahead, and if you care about this more, there's a whole paper exploring this, arguably kind of boring thing, but relevant to um, sequence alignment. So if we, if we chose k equal 10, there's four to the 10th possible 10 mers. That's uh, four to the 10th is about a million. Um, and I've cheated and, and used a table that's in this paper. And it turns out that every one of poss the 1,048,506 possible k mers exists in the human genome at least once. 
Um, so this, this paper and others, many others sort of in the 2004 to 2015 era, um, we're, we're comparing the trade-off between the length of a kamer, say from length you know, one all the way to 1,000, and the proportion of kamers of that length that are unique, exist once in a genome. Um, and I think what you can see, unfortunately the scale isn't quite great here, but let's break this down. There are one, two, three, four ticks between zero and 200, so each of these ticks represents 50 nucleotides. So when you get out to k equal 50, I'm going to look up the human genome, which is this blue line right there. What do, you, what do we call that? Like 92%? Uh, 92% of 50 mers in the human genome exist once and only once, or are therefore unique in the reference genome. So a fifth, k equal 50 is a, is a pretty decent choice for, for building an index um, because if you get a match in your read for a 50 mer, you're pretty confident that that's the right place. The trade-off, unfortunately, is that using k equal 50 with most implementations of this approach that I talked about uses too much memory. So in practice, um, sort of k equal sort of between 20 and 32 or 35 is sort of the is the sweet spot because if you look, you know, this curve is really steep. So even if we backed off and and moved out to like k equal 30. 80% of those 30 mers would be unique in the, in the human genome and, and be a nice substrate to quickly assign reads to possible locations in the genome. And I'm not really showing the data here. The amount of memory that's required for that smaller K size is, is amenable to running alignment on like a laptop like this. Okay, uh, so all that to say is that typically K is in the 20s or 30s uh, for most of these aligners. All right. So, Kamer uh, or hash based mapping um, or an analog called the Burroughs Wheeler transform, which we won't talk about today, but it's basically a fancy version of hash based aligner. They, they use those indexes to figure out possible locations in the genome. They choose one. Typically, they choose one. But for some reads, there might have been 100 possible options. So there's this, there's this value called the mapping quality that's very similar in spirit to the base quality we talked about in FASTQ files last time, which reflects the uncertainty that the aligner had in its choice of putting a sequence here in the reference genome versus here versus here versus here. Okay? So it's this, this same FRED scale where now it's not the probability of it's not the probability that a nucleotide is wrong it's the probability that the mapping location is wrong okay so assuming assuming that the sequence aligner the mapper um, can estimate that probability accurately then if the probability that the mapping location is wrong is one it's like well why did you tell me to look at that that location that's like the worst it's saying yeah I put it here but it doesn't belong here at all um, that means the log 10 of that is zero, so the mapping quality is going to be zero. If the probability that the mapping location is wrong is 0 0.1, we went through this math before, then the, the base 10 log of that is negative one, so we get a mapping quality of 10. And when we get all the way out to a mapping quality, uh, probability that the mapping location is wrong is 0 0.0001, um, we've got a mapping quality of 40. So same, same notion as the base quality stuff, the higher the mapping quality, the more confident that the, align, the aligner was that that location that chose to map the sequence was the right location. And there weren't many, there were very few, if any, alternative locations in the reference. Yeah. So if you have, um, when you get your sequence out of the fucking like fast key format, you have the quality score from the, do you have like a low quality score for the nucleotide? Does that like relax the matching to? And then match that's a that's a great question. Yeah, um, 
the best aligners do that. So the question, if I can rephrase it, is let's say there's a nucleotide in the sequence that the Illumina was like, yeah, this is wrong. Don't trust this nucleotide. A liner should be able to take, recognize that fact when it's comparing KMER options in the index and possible locations in the genome. It should not penalize a difference between the reference genome and that low quality base as much as it should penalize a difference between the reference genome and a higher quality base because there's uncertainty about the, the actual state of that nucleotide. And so aligners like BWA and Bowtie do, do that. Not all do. Right, so mapping quality is just like base quality, but it's the confidence in the, the mapping location. Um, but, but just thinking about this for a second, um, let's say you're doing uh, a counting experiment like RNA-seq. Your counts, the, all the alignments that you could count, you know, you align a bunch of cDNA molecules to uh, P53, and you're trying to compare the count of alignments in your uh, control state versus your experimental state. And the two, the two counts are hugely different. Your control state is much lower than your experimental state. And you'd be like, oh, cool, that's interesting. That, that supports the hypothesis. I thought if I knock down this other gene, P53 expression would go up. Cool. Print it. Let's go. Um, but what if half of the alignments to P53 in the experimental state had a very, very low mapping quality? Like the aligner was not quite certain that they belong there. You'd probably change your interpretation, right? So the map, the confidence that those sequences that are aligned to a given gene and a gene expression uh, um, setup really matter. Okay, so um, I'm looking at two different, this is a bit dated, but it's, it serves its purpose here. These are two different widely used aligners. You, some of you have probably heard of them before, BWA is the Burroughs Wheeler aligner um, uh, written by Hung Lee and Bowtie um, is the Bowtie aligner written by Ben Langmead as part of his PhD. Um, and what we're seeing is for the same data, the exact same experiment, the same FASTQ file aligned to the same reference genome, we're looking at the distribution of mapping quality scores that were assigned to all the sequences that were aligned. Um, so you can see that both of the aligners, BWA in green and Bowtie in blue, um, assign a very uncertain mapping quality score to like, uh, you know, between uh, up to like 30% of the sequences. So 30% of the sequences in the case of BWA, it's saying, yeah, I chose it here, but there were lots of other good locations and I don't really trust that it that it belongs here and only here. And at the other end of the spectrum, their bow tie assigned like 75% of the sequences a mapping quality that says, yep, it's here, trust me, don't look anywhere else, got this. But you notice that BWA assigned no sequences the same confidence. The highest value that it gives is 37. So there's two take home messages here. One, Clearly, these two algorithms use different approaches to estimating that probability that the mapping location was chosen erroneously, and therefore the distribution of mapping quality scores is different. And um, one is maybe a little more confident about its choices than the other. Um, this is a dated experiment. Uh, it's a little bit better now, but essentially a rule of thumb now is a mapping quality above 30 is a pretty confident alignment, re almost regardless of the sequence aligner that you use. Um, one of the tricks is what you do, how do you interpret sequences that have sort of these intermediate mapping quality values, like 20, 15, 7? Do you include them in your counting experiment or not? And really that, there is no strict answer there. Um, a lot of the tools, like like um, DEseq and other things which are looking for differential expression, baked into that um, it are assumptions about 
minimum mapping quality thresholds that those those tools use when they count reads that go into to the differential expression analysis or whatever. And whether or not those defaults um, are sane or useful relative to your data, um, by and large, they're typically good choices, but if it were me, I wouldn't trust it. Um, you might want to try different thresholds, see is, okay, what if, if I do a differential expression analysis and I get a list of a thousand genes that are overexpressed in condition A versus control using a mapping quality of 30 as the minimum, if I change that to 31, does the list go down to 10 differentially expressed genes? If so, there's probably something funky going on. So, but if it's stable, if that, if the genes that come up as being differentially expressed is stable relative to things like changes in mapping quality, um, you probably could trust your result. Now, you could, you could spend years um, exploring all the different possible things that could mess up these kind of experiments. And so there's the, you know, the trade-off between good enough and exploring every possible artifact. And that, um, that really depends upon the experimental system and, and how reproducible the data quality are and the, and the type of research that you're doing. Okay, so edit distance. Um, I talked about this quickly. Let's say there is a difference between a sequence that is mapped to a particular location in the genome. There's a difference between the sequence and the, and the reference genome, one or more differences. The edit distance is how many differences, how many changes must be made to either the reference genome or the sequence that's being aligned to it in order to make those two sequences identical. So I already gave an example. So curled and hurled have an edit distance of one. All we would need to do is substitute C for H or H for C. Um, shot and short, if we align them, have an edit distance of one. We can either delete the R from this sequence or insert an R in this sequence to make them identical. Okay? So it's just like, you know, when you're editing, the, the name edit distance comes from the fact like if you were to edit, if you misspelled, what how many changes did you make to the word to get it to be the right the right spelling of the word, right? Okay. Um, so in this case, let's take two sequences that are by eye pretty different, um, but they have some similarities. Let's say that this is the reference genome, and this is the, the sequence that came off the, uh, the, the Illumina sequencer. Um, BWA has said, yep, this is a candidate locus to which the sequence should be aligned. Now the question is, how do you align those two sequences? What is the alignment? Um, so I think there's a bit of a misconception in our field that like whether an alignment is correct or incorrect, there's really no such thing. An alignment is either optimal or suboptimal given choices about how the alignment procedure should be done. And we'll talk about that in a second. But there, to, to, to sort of drive that home a little bit, um, here's a possible alignment of these two sequences. We could have a gap, align that G to that G, open another gap, align those two T's, open a gap here, align the A, C, and then have two mismatches at the end. So if we tabulate, the, um, let me do this, tabulate the differences, we got one, two, three, four, five edits that would have to be made to uh, make these two sequences match, hence the edit distance is five. Alternatively, we could choose this alignment. We could start with a mismatch, have three matches, insert a gap, have two matches, and then have two mismatches. So in total, there's four edits. Okay, um, And there are other options for doing this. So um, this, this gets at the problem that this, this is actually a, a, a challenging problem. Because there are so many different ways to align, um, in the early days, like Dayhoff were built, was building um, you know, big repositories of amino acid sequences. And those amino acid sequences were being used to basically infer function um, by similarity to known function in model organisms and other things. And really just trying to get a sense of like what were the amino acid sequences that, that conferred structure and all these different things. So being able to compare and contrast sequences observed 
and one critter versus another and one cell type versus another was fundamental to inferring function. And that, that led to the realization that alignment, the proper alignment of amino acid sequences, which sort of preceded alignment of nucleotide sequences, um, getting that right was pretty critical to, to figuring out these similarities and dissimilarities and their, and their relationship to the function or differential function across different proteins or polypeptides. Um, and so there were innovations um, dating all the way back even before really, but the one I'm going to touch upon is from 1970. This is from uh, Saul Needleman and Christian Wunsch. Um, has anyone heard of Needleman-Wunsch alignment before even in passing? Yeah, you have? Okay. So um, this is so-called global alignment. Um, we'll get in, we won't really talk about global alignment, but when I walk through local alignment, which came from Smith and Waterman, I'll use that to sort of give you a sense of what local, global alignment would be. So uh, this Smith and Waterman um, local sequence alignment came out in 1981. Um, and really, this is the main sequence alignment algorithm that is used today. Um, it has been re-implemented in different languages, and there's been all sorts of ways to take this cool algorithm and apply it to things like GPUs and modern CPUs to make things faster. But the actual steps that the code is doing behind the scenes is really the same as what um, Smith and Waterman cleverly contrived back in the late 70s, early 80s, and published in 81. All right, so local alignment and global alignment. So local is Smith and Waterman, global is Neumann Wunsch. Um, they're both forms of something called dynamic programming, dynamic programming, which the dynamic really comes from the fact that um, it's kind of like choose your own adventure, as we'll show in a second. We're going to build up this matrix of values, and we use those matrix of values to choose the optimal path, which defines the optimal alignment given this scoring scheme. And I'm going to make that less uh, abstract in a second. So the dynamic really comes from the fact that once we build this matrix of scores, the path is, is really determined by uh, the values that are populated in that matrix. All right, so these are the same two sequences that I showed a couple slides ago, which we, you know, I showed two different ways to align them. Basically, we build a matrix, we add one extra row and one extra column. And this, as I'll hopefully show in a second, this allows us to have any nucleotide um, either match or have gaps between the alignments of the two sequences. All right, so we start out, so this is a rule. So basically what I'm walking through is um, pictorially how the algorithm for local alignment works according to the Smith-Waterman algorithm. So an algorithm, you've probably heard the word, you can't really read anything these days without hearing the word. Um, is really just a recipe. It's a set of rules that you follow the exact same way every time to get a reproducible outcome. So, you know, baking a cake follows an algorithm. Sometimes you introduce human error, but imagine you didn't and you get the same outcome every time. All right. Yes? The length of the sequences. Ah, uh, no. So, um, let's say this sequence, that's a good question. Assume this sequence was being aligned to the reference genome. We define a matrix that was the size of this sequence that came off the Illumina machine. Plus input, we'd add one row and one column. And the, the reference genome sequence that we would put on the top would be, we would extract the sequence out of the genome that the aligner said, try to align this sequence to this part of the uh, yank out that sequence and put it on the top of the, this matrix. Correct. Yep. That's a good point, because if it was the length of the camera, we wouldn't need to do alignment, because we know it's an exact match. Yep. All right, so we've added this extra row and column. That's step one of the algorithm. Step two of the algorithm is we initialize um, the first row and the first column with a zero. OK. Now what we do is we compare the first nucleotide of this sequence to the first nucleotide of this sequence. 
And this is where the scoring scheme comes in. If there's a match, we bump up the score by three, and we would put a three in this, in this cell, because the score has changed based upon that match. If there's a mismatch, um, we reduce the score by three, and if there's a gap, we reduce the score by one, with one exception. The score can never go below zero. So in this case, there's a mismatch. So an idea, you know, you'd think, oh, well, we, we make it a minus three. One of the rules of the Smith-Waterman algorithm is that the score can never go below zero. And as I hope I'll sort of bring it full circle, that's what makes it a local alignment. Um, we'll come back to that in a few slides. All right. So if we, if we basically chose this path, the score would be zero. If we chose this path, which would be in, introducing a gap, when we go off diagonal, diagonal is no gaps. If we go off diagonal, um, we introduce gaps. So I, I, we've probably not talked about dot plots, but if you've ever seen a dot plot, it's the same concept. On the diagonal, it's, it's exact matches, and when you go off diagonal, you're talking about insertions or deletions in the alignment of the sequence. All right, so if we choose to go off the, the main path uh, and then insert a gap, um, essentially a gap in this sequence, we would improve our score relative to this choice. So the score would go up by three because we now have a match. We get G versus G, so we reward that, okay? Um, I fast forward a little bit. I filled in all these other scores and jumping to this spot because it's, it's a bit instructive. So in this case, we've got T versus T, which from the previous cell, which was a six, if we chose this path, T versus T, the score goes up by nine. I'm sorry, up by three, two, nine. Um, and now what we're doing is we're at this cell and we're exploring three different options. So if I introduce a gap, um, I reduce the score by two and it becomes seven. Yeah. Oh, did I change it? Sorry about that. <laughs> um, and, and gap, if we go this way, it's minus two. So the score goes down. Um, and if I go this way, it's a mismatch, G versus A. So the score... Um, goes down more so than if a gap were introduced. Okay, sorry about the change in the gap score, but it doesn't really change the, uh, oh. Hey, that's the note to me uh, to change gap score. Uh, I'll do that later. I guess I forgot to do that last year. Okay, um, so we go on, we follow that same algorithm, we explore every cell, we look up the rows and columns, and we populate the, the, the cell with the right score. And then, so that's the, the, the next step in the algorithm. We fill out the whole matrix using these rules. Then the next step in the algorithm is to find the first, the, the cell with the highest score. So that, is, oops, I cheated. That is C versus C. The highest score in this whole matrix is 13. So essentially the alignment ends at that position and we're working backwards. So we've got C versus C, and so this is where the, the dynamic part comes in. It's the choose your own adventure part. So if we went to here, the score would go to eight. If we went to here, the score would go to 10, here eight. So the best choice to maximize the score is to go back diagonally to 10. Ah, blew it. So that gives us another match, A versus A. And then it's maximized if we introduce this gap, so G versus A and so on and so forth. This is called the trace back. So we're basically tracing back from the, the maximal score all the way to zero, okay? And the when you hit zero, that's where the alignment ends. So we don't have an entry for G versus T or, or T versus gap. It ends at G versus G, okay? So the zero, that's why we never go below zero. Zero is what tells the algorithm that's where the alignment stops. And that's what makes it local. The T and the G, the T of this sequence and the G of this sequence are not part of the alignment. Nor are the T and the A from this sequence and the G and the G. So we actually don't get a full, we don't use all the nucleotides in the two sequences. So that's what makes it local. 
the Needleman Wunsch, the global algorithm, it uses, it forces the use of all the nucleotides in the sequence. Okay? And that, that has utility in other contexts, and actually, arguably, has utility in nucleotide uh, sequence context, but it actually introduces, um, if you're looking for single nucleotide changes, you know, Needleman Wunsch would force all these uh, alignments, so you get a lot of um, things that look like um, single nucleotide difference, but are actually differences that are introduced by forcing the use of all the nucleotides in the sequence by global alignment. So, um, so having said all that, local alignment or the Smith-Waterman algorithm is, is typically the one that's used for most of the work that you do today. We use BWA. First step, they take all the billion sequences, they find all the locations in the genome to which they could align. Then for each of those reads, for each of those locations, they do this. And, and you can imagine, like, this was what? Um, three, six, nine by nine. That was 81 computations that had to, be, had to be done for this little short sequence. If it's 150 nucleotide, it's like 150 times 150 operations that have to be done. And then you have to do this trace back, and then you emit the sequence. So that gives you a sense of why um, alignment is actually a really computationally expensive thing. Yeah. Which one? He, here? This would be a mismatch. But going from here to here led to a match, which led to the 0 to 3 change. But this is still on diagonal, so that would be a mismatch. But you, if you cannot start or end on a, on a mismatch, and that's reflected in the fact that this is also the score drops to 0. So that tells the, the algorithm, nope, don't include. Oh, that's the, the fact that I opened a gap in this sequence to register the two. Okay, so it's an insertion in this sequence relative to that, or it's a deletion in this sequence relative to that. Okay, this is a local alignment. It's, as I just said, it's the subset. Um, just for review, these are the two, um, these are the two papers if you want to go check them out. Um, they're not terribly digestible. Um, which is why I try to use a graphical representation of it. Um, but just to give you a broader sense of, if we compare these two sequences, this is the Smith-Waterman alignment of this sequence to this sequence. And you can see that it truncates um, some of the nucleotides. Um, but this, this is actually, I'm not showing some nucleotides that were omitted from the, from the local alignment. And this is in comparison the global alignment, so every nucleotide from both sequences is used, and you can see that these are fundamentally different alignments. The edit distance between the global, uh, is the, the, the edit distance here is much higher than the edit distance above. The caveat being that, you know, this has removed, removed nucleotides from the alignment that um, would have increased the edit distance. It's sort of just removing them from the equation. Um, so, uh, as I said, this local uh, Smith-Waterman algorithm is, is typically what's used today for finding things like SNPs and, and um, aligning short nucleotide sequences to the reference genome. Okay, so that's all I have for today. Today what we covered uh, is mapping and alignment and sort of the, some of the challenges in doing this. What we're going to talk about on Thursday is yet another new format, which is called SAM or BAM or now CRAM format, which is essentially the file that tools like BWA and Bowtie and STAR and all these other things emit the alignment information in. And that BAM or CRAM or SAM file is the substrate for doing things like variant calling or differential expression analysis or finding chip seek peaks. We need to know where all the alignments in the FASTQ file are in the genome and that allows us to scan along the genome and look for differences or count depth to look at RNA expression and things like that. So we're going to get into the gory details of what those formats are. Um, and the homework coming off of that will be basically using tool sets to allow you to manipulate BAM and CRAM and SAM files, which 
is a sort of fundamental skill, uh, something you end up doing all the time. Um, okay, so that's it. Thank you.